Milwaukee Road Class EP2 rebuilds. Now, hold on. Put down your torches and pitchforks. Please, hold on. Let me, let me clarify what I'm talking about specifically before anybody gets mad. Because this seems like a really weird choice to even put on the list. But there is a reason for it, and let me explain. Now, the EP2s, also known as the Bipolars, were built by General Electric in 1919 for the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific Railroad, also known as just the Milwaukee Road. And they were exceptional for their time. By utilizing their bipolar electric motors, they were able to outpull most steam engines of their era and served faithfully for a long time. Efficient, reliable, they were great locomotives. So that probably raises the issue, um, why in the blue heck are these even on the list? They aren't bad at all. And yes, that's true until they were rebuilt. Because this is a really odd case, because usually when I talk about poor locomotive design, oftentimes I'll mention that even if a locomotive does get good, sometimes when they first start out, they were really bad. In fact, some of the British Rail things I've discussed before have done that exact thing, where they were awful when they were introduced, but occasionally British Rail will have gone in and fixed the problems, and they become better as a result. But the EP2s are the opposite of that. They started out great, and then towards the end of their life, well, here's what happened. In 1953, they were starting to suffer degrade from just being worn out in general. They'd been used extensively for 35 years, and during World War II, they were pushed even harder. So they had to be rebuilt and be given some improvements. Now, the first five, E1 through E5, were all rebuilt at the Tacoma shops, and performed as they were supposed to do. They, they were rebuilt very well, and even though they went over budget, still, the results were good, so they were fine with that. However, because of the budget issue, the other four bipolars were sent to the Milwaukee shops. This is relevant because the workers in the Milwaukee shops were not accustomed to working on electric locomotives, like, at all. And according to the electrification department head, Lawrence Wiley, they did a poor job. Wiley's successor, T.B. Kirk, got a little more specific in this regard and said that he himself witnessed a group of disconnected wires on a newly rebuilt EP2 that were just bundled together and tagged with a note that said, we don't know where these go. After they were rebuilt, they were prone to electrical fires and constant failures, and apparently the Milwaukee shop crews had messed them up so bad that even the Tacoma shops could not correct them. As a result, they saw decreased use over time. And by 1962, all were scrapped, with the exception of Locomotive E2, which is still on display at the Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri. Looking really good. It's been on static display for a long time, and it's a good bit of history to go see if you're ever in that area. And for me, this is just kind of a sad story, because, real talk, these were great locomotives that were ruined. They were turned into bad locomotives through budget cuts and ineptitude. So it's just kind of a shame overall. But hey, we know they were good once, and I'm sure plenty of us will still appreciate them for that. The EMD VL2. I get this one requested a lot, and for a long time I was pushing against the idea of putting it on the list, because technically speaking, from a mechanics perspective, this is a totally fine diesel electric locomotive. In terms of reliability or fuel consumption or speed or anything like that, it's totally fine. There's no issues there. The problem is that it was built to occupy a very strange niche that really just doesn't exist. It's, it's a space that didn't need to be occupied. You may look at this locomotive and think it looks a little weird, and don't worry, it does. And that's because it was designed specifically to occupy the space between a car body diesel and a hood unit. Now, the idea was that this would give the locomotive the strengths of both types, being a superior design overall. Problem is that, no, no, what actually happened is that you got all the drawbacks of both designs with none of the benefits. It doesn't look as nice as a car body. It's not as easy to repair as a hood unit. The railings do not go all the way around, only on the front and the back, making it very difficult to work with for switch crews. And since it was really only powerful enough to be a switcher, you couldn't utilize it for passenger service either. 
and plus, again, it doesn't look as nice as some of the other car bodies. Some rail fans even call this locomotive ugly, and I try to avoid that word when it comes to locomotives because beauty is in the eye of beholder, but I admit, they're definitely funny looking engines. It was also considered to be mechanically unreliable, however, this is disputed on the basis that it was less that it was mechanically unreliable, and more that the crews couldn't be bothered to fix it because they didn't like it and it was a pain in the butt to get into. So, you know, take from that what you will. Only 59 were ever made, and very few railways even gave them a shot. Although by some weird twist, multiple individuals of this locomotive have been preserved. Number 32, number 81, 82, 52, 54, 56, and 557 are all still around in various locations around America. So I guess you might be able to see one someday, I don't know why, but I mean, I guess that's nice. The New Zealand Railways Department WJ Class. This locomotive was a 284T, a tank engine, a big tank engine, and it was nicknamed Jumbo. Only one was ever created, and she was specifically designed for banking helping other trains get over long hills. In the Wellington area where she worked, there were long grades around there, and she was quite useful in terms of helping other locomotives, and for literally nothing else. And in fact, according to sources, drivers and firemen actually despised the locomotive, because while they admitted that, yeah, she was very, very powerful, that's all she was. She was so powerful that she had a really, really bad habit of breaking herself. She had cast frames of the bar type, and she had a rather consistent knack for breaking them, repeatedly, every time she went to do anything. I mean, she would be successful at what she did, but then she would need repaired immediately after. And it was a nightmare. No locomotive should break every time they went to do something, and Jumbo seemed to really like doing that. It didn't help that the spot that the frames kept breaking in was behind the smoke box saddle, so getting to it to make the repair was a nightmare as well. Over time, Jumbo fell out of favor, and she was withdrawn in 1927, and written off in 1928. Most of her was scrapped, but her boiler wound up being used as a washout boiler. The Great Western Railway 2602 class, also known as Krugers. Well, that's a funny looking engine. Huh. Why is the boiler up like it just... What? Why is... Okay, whatever. These were experimental locomotives that were designed by William Dean. However, it is believed that his subordinate, George Jackson Churchward, was actually mostly responsible for the experimentation that was going on here. What was weird about this one? Well, the boiler operated at a higher pressure than normal. Not high pressure like the Fury, but still higher than normal. As a result, its combustion chamber and the long 28-inch stroke of the inside of the cylinders caused fractures of the solid crank axles. This problem persisted and could not be resolved. And though they were withdrawn, their boilers actually survived for a little longer and converted for stationary use in Swindon Works at reduced pressure. And they remained in service there to the 50. So, you know, I guess that's a win, sort of. N no, not really. That's, that's not really a way to go for any steam locomotive, I think. The British Rail Class 800. You know, I'm not even gonna bother yelling at you. I'm starting to think you might enjoy it. But to be honest, I can't even yell at British Rail because they're not directly responsible for this one. This is an entirely different issue because British Rail went defunct in 1997. The actual utilizers of this locomotive are the Great Western Railway and the London Northeastern Railway. Now, I would blame them, but I'm not going to because they did not actually manufacture these things. Even though they're called British Rail Classes, these locomotives aren't British in any way. They were made by Hitachi, the Japanese corporation. And Hitachi has made good high-speed locomotives before. This ain't one of them. At least, not so far. Admittedly, this is another very recent locomotive to put on this list, and to be fair, the verdict's still out as to how bad the 800s really are. But lately, it hasn't been looking good. And to their credit, when they're operating accordingly, when they're working fine, they're actually very good train sets overall. They're quick, they're efficient, they're comfortable, there's no issues there. But that's like with anything, when it's working. And after a few years of service, they started noticing issues. The first major problem was an issue with overheating, particularly in the summer. With the way the generators are designed, it meant that ventilation wasn't consistent. In the limited space they occupied, they became very prone to overheating. In fact, in Modern Railways magazine, there was the claim that in the summer of 2018, 
half of the units were taken out of action as the engines shut down because they were overheating. Now that's dubious at best, that seems like a bit of an exaggeration, I hope it is, but maybe it's not, maybe they're really that bad. But the real issues didn't start until a bit later, actually quite recently, just last year. It was discovered in the spring of 2021 that the Class 800 were suffering stress cracks on various components, whether it be the yaw damper brackets or whether it be the lifting pads. By the way, stress cracks at the speeds these locomotives operate are nothing to mess around with, so the railways had to suspend most of the trains. This caused a significant confusion and delay on trains between London to Scotland and to the west of the UK. It was a mess. Some of the locomotives did return to service on the 13th of May, but the verdict's still out on a few of them as they require more serious repairs and a long-term fix for the problem. Because of all this, the 800 is currently seen by many rail fans over in the UK as being awful. Terrible? Yes, just appropriate for this list. But I do want to come to its defense a little bit on the basis that it's still pretty early in this locomotive's life cycle. And we have seen other locomotives become better, even though they started out very poorly. So it's possible they may be able to figure out a way to utilize these locomotives effectively, and the Class 800s may serve for years to come. That, or they'll cut their losses and replace them with something else. Like, maybe they'll keep using the Class 43s. Because they still are. Because the 800s are supposed to replace the 43s, and they can't take the 43s out of service because the 800s are so bad. Fun times. Till next time, this is Darkness, and to be Dwell a Fond, farewell.